morning. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the, to the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me his heart. Then the lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out at as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, he, so he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars, and Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I might lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillar, pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed his strength, bowed with his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So then the dead so the dead who were killed at his death were more than those who he had killed during his life. And the brothers of, and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ishtel in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He judged Israel 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks for reading that, Richard. Um, an article came out a couple weeks ago in the Gospel Coalition, I think, and it said something along the lines of, uh, it's talking about that situation that happens when you've been like inviting these friends to church for like months and months and months, and then they finally show up, and it's the youth guy preaching, <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> um, I'm Austin Lennox. I am the youth uh, pastor here at uh, Redeemer Memphis. And if you've been with us this summer, you'll know that we've been going through this series that we're calling The Bible's Greatest Hits. And what we're doing is we're trying to revisit kind of these, literally, we're taking a page out of kind of your Sunday school curriculum that you may have had growing up as a kid. And we're trying to re-examine these foundational, super influential and important stories uh, from the Bible, uh, from the Old Testament, and trying to see them in fresh ways. And so a fun fact uh, about the sermon that you're about to hear uh, is that this was Matt's first sermon to ever preach in this room. Uh, ben preached uh, on Samson a year ago during Lent, and uh, I'm preaching on it today. And so that's three Samson sermons in three years. And so I don't know what God is up to in your life, but um, apparently you need to hear this. And uh, there, there are actually some competing views around the office 
about Samson and about Judges 13 through 16. There's been some controversy. There's been some discussion, which just goes to show you how little controversy and excitement we deal with uh, on a weekly basis here at Redeemer. Uh, But let's just jump in because we we have a lot to get to. Uh, I want to think about uh, Samson in three ways. I want to think about Samson the myth. Sorry. Samson the man first. Samson the myth and yes, Samson the legend. And I will explain more about that when we get there. So Samson the man. Uh, Samson gets four chapters in this book that we're in called Judges, which is a pretty good chunk. And uh, it's going to be impossible to cover all of it. But there's some really important things that you need to know about Samson before we get to the story that Richard just read for us. And so first, he's a judge. Okay. And what that means is in this book of Judges, when Samson comes on the scene, It says that the people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Because, see, the book of Judges has this cycle to it, okay? And it's the same thing that happens all throughout the book is that God's people do what is evil. They turn away from him. They worship these other gods. You know, they, they, they depart from, from the Lord. And what God does is he, he raises this opposing nation to kind of come in and, like, oppress and overpower and, and kind of push on Israel and oppress them. And then what Israel does is they cry out to God. They say, maybe Yahweh will save us. And so they cry out for deliverance. Lord, please save us. And he does every time. He he raises up these heroes in the Old Testament that we call judges. And so think about them like they're they're deliverers. They're rescuers. They're these saviors and these heroes uh, of the Old Testament. And so Israel gets saved. And they have peace for like 30, 40, 50 years. And then they forget And they go back and they do the same thing again and again and again, repeat ad nauseum uh, for 21 chapters. And so Samson is the 12th judge, which if you've been around the Bible or Christianity for a minute, you'll know that that's a pretty important number. Uh, He's the last judge of Israel before we get to King David. But But I bring up the context of judges because it is so easy to approach these stories and think, man, I they just have no bearing on our lives today, uh, right? But, but in this book of Judges, right, the theme song of the day, right, this phrase that keeps appearing numerous times throughout the book uh, is that the people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes. It pops up everywhere. That what gets Israel in trouble, that may, leads them to needing you know, to be saved, crying out uh, under their slavery and oppression, is that they just did what was right in their own eyes, And that just sounds a lot like us. And it sounds a lot like the culture we inhabit, that we kind of live in this society where it's like, man, like, you do what's right for you. Just whatever you think is right in your own eyes, that's what you go do, and it'll all be okay. And so we're the exact same. Our era is the exact same. We think that uh, with the right life hacks, maybe some self-help philosophy from TikTok, you can pull yourself up from your bootstraps and kind of become a decent person. But what you see in Judges is that the people of Israel, they don't just need uh, good advice. They don't just need tips and tricks and techniques. Uh, They need to be saved. They need to be rescued from an enemy that that they can't defeat on their own. And it's in that context that we get Samson. And so part of Samson, the man, is is that he's a judge. Uh, The next thing you need to know about Samson is that he has what we call a, a birth narrative. And what that means is that the Bible, when Samson is born, it goes into way more detail and way more specifics about it than it does uh, with, with normal births. And so two things happen when Samson is born. First, an angel of the Lord shows up to his parents. Not a normal thing. <laughs> that just didn't really happen all the time. So this angel of the Lord comes to the family, and it's actually the wife of the family, the, the future mother of Samson, she's barren. So she can't have kids, and and this angel of the Lord says, hey, you're going to have a son, and it's not just going to be any son. Uh, He's going to be a Nazarite. That's the third thing you need to know about Samson. He's going to be a Nazarite for his entire life, from birth to death, which means he can't cut his hair, uh, he can't come in contact with dead people, uh, and he can't eat any grape products. Kind of interesting that those are the three things, but... um, but that's it. That's, that's Samson. So he's good to, he, got, he has this birth narrative. He's a Nazarite for all of his life. And if you know your New Testament pretty well, uh, you're starting to see some similarities between Samson's birth narrative and somebody else in the New Testament. And it's John the Baptist. Uh, 
right? That in both of these guys' history, what you get is an angel of the Lord coming to the family where the woman is barren, and he says, hey, you're going to conceive a son who's going to be a Nazarite for life. They're the only two in the Bible that this is talked about. And that they're actually going to be a forerunner for a coming king, right? I'm not talking about like the Toyota vehicle. I'm saying that they are going to blaze a trail and prepare a path for a coming king. Uh, And so as one scholar points out, there are numerous features that connect Samson and John the Baptist. And all of these things, like the reason I bring this birth narrative up and all this stuff is that when something like this happens, it's as if the Bible is saying, hey, like, get ready. Like, something really big is about to happen. And so both are born uh, to older, barren parents. Both are Nazarites for life. Uh, Both Samson and John the Baptist are betrayed to their death by women who are kind of less than reputable if you will. Uh, And they're both forerunners for the arrival of a great king. And so remember, right, Samson is the 12th and final judge in Israel. He's the last one. Uh, He's paving the way towards this king who's going to come. And so Samson is going to begin this battle with the Philistines, uh, but it's David who's coming, who's going to eventually slay Goliath, end the, the, the skirmish, eradicate the Philistines from the land. And so again, Samson is to King David as John the Baptist is to Jesus. He's a forerunner and a preparation for a coming king. The parallels are just too uncanny. And Matt is actually preaching about King David next week, and so think of this sermon as a forerunning preparation uh, to the great sermon coming next week. The, the parallels just write themselves. Uh, and so fourthly, right, he's, he's a Nazarite, judge, birth narrative, all this stuff. Fourthly, you need to know that Samson, for lack of a better term, is spiritual. He's spiritual. He's spirit-filled. And here's what I mean. In Judges 13, it says that Samson grew and God blessed him and that the spirit of the Lord began to stir him up. And so what you see in this book of Judges is that these judges, the way they bring salvation, the way they bring victory and peace and redemption to Israel is that the spirit of the Lord would rush upon them and literally they would be able to do these amazing things that would be impossible to do in their own strength and that that's how Israel would be saved from their oppression. But out of all the 12 judges in the book of Judges, We're not told about every single one that this happens, that the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon them. And if you are told that the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon this judge, you're only ever told once. From Judges 13 to 16, we are told four different times that the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon Samson. And so I think you can make the case, like certain Old Testament scholars have, that Samson is the most Spirit-filled judge that you find in the entire book. And so he's this man greatly used by God, blessed to defeat the enemies of Israel. He's super strong. Uh, Apparently, he kills a 1,000 people with the jawbone of a donkey. And so if you Google image search Samson, uh, you see all these images of these just massive dudes, right? just rippling abs and, and gorging biceps. And yet most commentators think that Samson probably looked more like me than he did uh, The Rock, and, and here's why. Because all throughout uh, the book of Judges, all throughout his story, the Philistines are constantly asking, where does his strength come from? How is this guy able to do all of these crazy things that he does? Because if you just look at the guy, he doesn't look like somebody. If he just looked like Rambo walking around, they'd probably be like, well, yeah, that's how he does it. I mean, look at the guy. And so I think he's, he's kind of scrawny. All right, and so those are the things you need to know about Samson, the man. He's a judge, special birth narrative like John the Baptist, forerunner to a great king. He's a Nazarite, uh, spirit-filled guy, scrawny and not strong-looking. That's point one, Samson, the man. All right, Samson, the myth. Because maybe what I've said has already busted up some categories that you have in your mind about the kind of guy that Samson is. If you go deep into biblical scholarship, uh, Samson is kind of a polarizing figure. Uh, Let me just read what some commentators have said about him. One guy says that he is anything but a paragon of virtue. Uh, One writer said that he is a lust-addicted Nazarite. Someone said that he is all brawn and no brains. A wild donkey of a man, unpredictable, so promising but so tragic uh, that he's intemperate and he's immature. And the list goes on and on and on. And here's why they say that. 
People want to point to the fact that Samson married outside of Israel. That in Judges 14, he marries a woman who is a Timnite, uh, who is a part of the Philistines, right? And so his parents probably had this Obi-Wan Kenobi moment where they say, you're supposed to defeat the Philistines, not join them, right? And here Samson is marrying this foreign lady. And yet it says in Judges 14 that that's from God, that Samson is seeking a way to kind of infiltrate the Philistines and bring them down from the inside. Okay. Also, Samson says that this Timnite woman was right in his eyes. And you should be thinking, well, didn't you say that's like the whole problem in Israel right now is that like everyone is just doing whatever's right in their own eyes? How is Samson any different? But think about it this way. If Israel is full of people who are not very righteous, what if Samson looks at a woman and says, actually, she is right. In my eyes, she might even be more right than some of the people in my own country. And so again, I just think maybe the narrative about Samson gets it wrong a little bit. People want to point to the fact uh, that he makes contact with the corpse of a lion, that he scrapes some honey out of it, and that he eats it, uh, and that he breaks one of his Nazarite vows to not come in contact with the dead. But commentators are torn on whether or not he even breaks his vow. Because when you read number six, which is where all the Nazarite vow stuff is, it says they cannot touch a corpse, even the corpse of a family member which makes some people think maybe they're just talking about people, right? That they're probably just talking about human corpses. Uh, In Judges 14, Samson throws this big feast, right? And there's booze there. There's alcohol. And so some folks think, man, look, again, he's breaking his Nazarite vows again. But if you go back and read in Judges 14, you're, you're not told that he drinks. You're just told that his family throws this feast. And look, I am not trying to get up here in front of you this morning and say that I think Samson is like a picture-perfect Boy Scout, okay? (laughs) But, like, there's a reason why I want to kind of undo some of these things that we think about Samson. And, look, when we get to our passage, right, it, it is not at all crazy to say, well, look at Delilah. Like, why her? Why would you get mixed up with this obviously terrible woman who's trying to do these terrible things that eventually leads to the cutting of his hair, right, which is the breaking of the final Nazarite vow? Like, isn't it obvious that she's up to something? And people want to say, well, of course, Samson, you know Samson, he's just blinded by lust again, just letting women take advantage of him and do whatever they want. But if you look in verse 15 in your bulletin, it says that three times before this, that he had lied to her about what his weaknesses really were. And so that when they did that thing, when she does that thing to him to try to make him weak, it says each time the Philistines just magically show up, right? He's like, hey, if you want to, you know, make me like any normal guy, just do this. And she's like, okay, I'll do this. And then she does it. And then she's like, oh, no, the Philistines are here. Samson, what are you going to do? And that happens three times. And so I just want to say Samson's not an idiot, Like, Samson knows what she's doing. He knows what she's up to. And if you know anything about Delilah, you'll know that she's from this valley. Um, I have it written down somewhere, and I can't find it. But she's Sorek. She's from this valley called Sorek, and it's right up next to the Philistines, North Israel. It would be like you, if you're a volunteer fan, saying, well, I'm going to go marry and live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I'm just going to try to infiltrate and take down the program from the inside. Right? Look... I think that's what Samson's doing, that he's searching for a way to get close, to get close to the Philistines, just like he did with his first bride, right? Because he's trying to defeat the enemies of God's people. He's trying to bring salvation to this nation of Israel. Uh, I recently saw a movie that I think kind of captures this idea really well. It's called The Pianist uh, with Adrian Brody. And it's this fantastic World War II era film. And it's about this incredible piano player. I can't pronounce his first name, but we'll just call him Spillman. It's his last name. And it's about him and his family. And they live in Warsaw, Poland uh, during Germany's, uh, Germany's invasion of them. They're under German occupation. And the bulk of the movie kind of focuses on Spillman's desire and quest to stay in Warsaw, to not leave the city, but to actually stay. And there's numerous moments in the film where to do that, to kind of get away undetected, that he actually has to go as close as he can get uh, to the enemy. And so there's this scene where he's on public transit and he's taking this bus to an apartment to hide. And the guy kind of training him on how to get away with all this says, look, you, you have to go to the front of the bus right where the German only section is. 
Because that's the last place they would expect to see a Jew who's trying to run from the Germans. And they get this apartment for him, this flat, and it's right across the street from like this major German hub where there's a hospital and there's all these leaders around. And he's like, this is crazy. I'm like right across the street. I can see them. And they say, that's exactly where you need to be. You need to be as close as you can possibly get because it's the last place they would think to look for you. And so I say all this to say that I think Samson's trying to do the same thing, that he's subversively trying to get close to the enemy to find a way to defeat them. And look, the reason that I've spent way too much time trying to defend Samson's reputation, to defend his image, is because if Samson is the scoundrel that he's been made out to be by so many people, then how can Hebrews 11 say what it says about him? And so if you'll open up to the, the sermon reflections or, uh, in the front of your bulletin, you'll see um, there's this passage from Hebrews that's printed in there. And look, I, I, I don't know about you, but... I want to think about Samson the way the Bible thinks about Samson, right? I want to think about Samson the way that God seems to think about Samson. And so I'm just going to read it right now, right? It says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and enforced justice and obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. One Old Testament scholar says that if you were to look at all of the 20 things that Hebrews 11 says about these great heroes of the Old Testament, that 15 of the 20 apply to Samson. I think 15 out of 20 of those things apply to Samson. And again, why am I doing this? Why am I bringing up all this stuff to say that I think we've gotten Samson a little bit wrong and a little bit misunderstood? And it's because I think this myth that Samson is just this horrible, wretched scoundrel of a person, it's really attractive to us. That the myth is really attractive. And here's why. We read Samson and we automatically think, where do I fit in in this story? And because we are who we are uh, at the time that we're in, we immediately think, well, surely I'm Samson. Like, what can I learn about myself from Samson? What can I learn from him? And so we read this story and we come away saying things like this. If you have a past, if you are a mess, God loves messes. God uses messes. Messes can end up in the hall of faith. God can use them to do great things. And while all of those things are so deeply true, if that's the conclusion we come to at the end of Samson, then I think we've missed something, right? If we look at Samson and we kind of delight ourselves in what we wrongly think are his shortcomings, then I think we've misunderstood the text. Because the point of Samson isn't to make me feel better about myself or to remind me that God can use even broken and messy sinners like me. Yes, that is true. And rather... In Samson, we're to see that God is faithful to his people, or that God demonstrates that he will save his people from their enemies. Instead of reading the story and, and automatically looking inwards at ourselves, we're supposed to read it and look upwards and see that, oh, this, this is all about a Savior who's coming into the world, who's going to defeat the enemies of God's people, who's going to bring peace and joy and life to a people who are spiritually blind, who are dead, who need help. And we know that a Savior is coming, right? And for us, a Savior has come, a truer and better Samson. And so here's where we get to the legend, right? If that's Samson the man, Nazarite, judge, birth narrative, scrawny, spirit-filled, if that's the myth that he's this kind of scoundrel, awful paradigm of virtue, then what's the legend? Right? Well, and here's what I mean. It, if you're familiar with maps, if you're a cartographer, uh, you know that a legend is this small box in the bottom corner of the map, and it's got all these symbols and lines and things, and what it does is it helps you read the map, right? It tells you what these symbols mean and what these lines mean, and so when you look at the map, you're able to actually read it and actually understand it. And so what's, what's the legend of Samson? How are we supposed to read it? How are we supposed to understand it? And it's this, is that Samson is a type of Christ, uh, that Samson is what the book of Hebrews will call a shadow, 
that he is an example of the things that are to come in the New Testament. And so here's what I mean. Think about it this way. What, what the New Testament is, it's many things, but I think mainly what the New Testament is trying to do is it is like a spotlight that is just trying to shine on Jesus Christ, right? God's Son. And the New Testament is shining its light on Jesus Christ. And so what the Old Testament is, is the shadow that Jesus is casting, And so what I mean is that when you read the Old Testament, there are all these different places where you should start to think, oh my gosh, that that looks a lot like Jesus. I'm starting to see the faint outline and contours of the gospel that I get in the New Testament. I'm starting to see it even in the Old Testament. Uh, Maybe you're familiar with the the meme with uh, Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker. Uh, He's my Spider-Man that I had growing up. And uh, in this meme, right, like Peter Parker, he he gets bitten by this radioactive spider and it turns him into like a superhuman type of guy. And so he realizes when he wakes up the next day, he puts his glasses on and, and everything is super blurry. Because his vision's been fixed. He takes his glasses off and he can see clearly, puts them on blurry. And so in the Old Testament, it's kind of like reading with Peter Parker's glasses. You're like, ah, I can kind of see him, but it's a little blurry. But, but, but I know he's there. That looks, up, that looks a lot like Jesus. And then you get to the New Testament and the spectacles come off. And you're like, you're, oh my gosh. You're like, this is the guy we've been waiting for. This is the guy that all of these stories have been pointing to and talking about and telling me of. And so I'm just going to really quickly run through the passage in front of you, and I'm just going to make some statements, and I want you to tell me who this sounds like. In verses 15 through 19, Samson is betrayed by somebody he loves, right? somebody who should have been devoted to him and protect him. He's betrayed by a friend for some silver, Right in verse 20, at one point you see that the Lord leaves Samson so that Samson can be captured in his weakness and bound by evil men to be taken away unjustly. In verse 21, you see that Samson is made to be blind to represent a people who are spiritually blind, who are doing whatever is right in their own eyes. It is like Samson is becoming a physical representation and embodiment of the very people that he's trying to save. It's as if he's taking upon himself the very thing that is killing God's people. Then you get to verses 23 through 25, and you see that Samson is taken into the temple of a Philistine god so that eventually he can defeat the Philistines through his death. Right? And at verse 28, at the apex and climax of his life, as he is about to die, what does Samson do? It says he prays. That he cries out and he prays to God to give him strength to defeat the enemies of God's people. Jesus was betrayed by Judas, right? a friend, somebody who was supposed to protect him, somebody who should have been devoted to him, and he did it for a bag of silver. On the cross, it says that God's face turns away from Jesus, that in this moment, God has to abandon and reject his son. Why? Because on the cross, in that moment, what Jesus has become is the embodiment of our sin, the very thing that is killing God's people. Right, The New Testament goes so far to even use this kind of language, that on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's just like Samson. Jesus takes on and becomes the very thing that is killing God's people. And at the apex of Jesus' life, he too cries out on the cross. But instead of a prayer like Samson's that contains elements of selfishness and revenge, Jesus' prayer on the cross contains grace and mercy and forgiveness for his enemies. Um, there's, there's a pastor that you may be familiar with named Eugene Peterson. Um, we, we love him a lot around here. He's this famous pastor who died not that long ago. Uh, and at his funeral, his son spoke, and he said, uh, my dad really only ever had one sermon. And in a poem that he wrote to his father at his funeral, he reads this to his dad. He says, it's almost laughable how you fooled them, how for 30 years every week you made them think that you were saying something new. They didn't know how simple it all was. They were blind to your secret. Because for 50 years you would steal into my room at night and whisper softly to my sleeping head that it is the same message over and over and over again. God loves you. He is on your side. He is coming after you. 
and he is relentless. One sermon. And so I think it's the same with the Bible, that there is one story, and that it's this story, and that you start to see it everywhere, right? That God saves his people, or that God is committed to saving a people who cannot save themselves, a people who have gotten themselves into trouble that they cannot get themselves out of. And so it's the same with Redeemer, that we are about one thing, and it is this gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ. And if we ever stop ending every sermon the exact same way, please go find a different place to go to church. And so, like I said, if we read Samson and we try to compare ourselves to him, then I think we've missed it. Because in this story, if we're anyone, we are the nameless, faceless Israelite who is just cowering in the corner, hoping desperately that this Savior is going to come through for them. That this hero that God's raised up might really be able to defeat their enemies and bring peace and salvation to them again. And so, what... The thing that we most need this morning is not to be told that God can use even deeply flawed and broken people. Hear me say, yes, that is true. Of course that is true. But the thing we most need to hear, you and I this morning, is that we have a hero, that we have a a savior and a deliverer to rescue us from these enemies, enemies that we can't beat on our own. And look, I don't know about you. I'm I'm hoping that you're a better person than me. Uh, When I am tempted to think about who my enemies are, I'm tempted to think that it's a slow walker, you know, or that it's traffic. All all the things that burden me most are just inconvenience, right? Those are my big enemies. Look, you you might really be tempted to think that your biggest enemies are, are actually a certain type of people group in the world that exists, that you're like, man, those people are our enemies, but Scripture says that, that, that Christ came to defeat our real enemies, our actual enemies, things like our own sin and the guilt that comes with it, right? That the ways that we know that we are deeply flawed and deeply broken, irreparably, and the shame and the hiding and the guilt, the unhealthy coping, right, the unhealthy numbing that comes in the wake of, no, of those things, and we need to be rescued from death, the final affront to God's great design for human beings. And so in Jesus, we have a truer and better Samson. We have a Savior who is willing to give up himself to his captors and to give his life to defeat the enemies of sin and death to save the people that he loves. And so Samson is giving us a picture of what God is like, that in Jesus, God would taste death to save his bride, the church. And so is Samson deeply flawed? Sure, yes. Find a hero from the Old Testament who isn't. But he points us to a Savior who isn't flawed, right? One who doesn't just judge for 20 years, like verse 31 says, uh, but a Savior who even now, right this second, is seated at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning over all of creation, and he's going to do it for eternity. And so that is our hope, and that is our peace, and that is what gives us life. And so that's the invitation this morning, is that you would believe it, and that you would hold on to it, and that you would live out of it. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Jesus um, you've given us a Savior, Uh, that you have not just given us good advice or tips or tricks or techniques on how we can make it through this life a little bit easier, uh, but that you actually save us. You actually come in and do all the work that we can't do to save us from sin and its guilt and its shame and from our death. And that you don't tell us how to save ourselves, but that you tell us there is one who has saved you. And so, God, for me and for my friends here this morning, would we look at him? Would we find him more beautiful and more believable than we did when we showed up? It's in his name we pray. Amen.